really honored to I'm uh, really honored to be uh, part of this uh, session today. So I hope that uh, all of you are uh, going to be able to take away something from uh, today's uh, session. And I'm going to be talking about the flow model and the page object pattern and what are the differences between these two patterns. So my name is uh, Peter Feltazi Jr. I'm uh, originally from uh, Hungary. Right now I live in the USA and I work as a quality architect there, which is basically a consultant uh, role. And my background is of course testing, but primarily test automation in all levels of the pyramid. I've been working in UI, API, and even all the way down to unit level. And uh, so that's uh, quickly about myself. And uh, let me, uh, talk more about the actual uh, presentation uh, today and what the agenda is going to be. So it's all going to be about design patterns. And first, of course, I would like to talk about design patterns in general. Then it's going to be the page object pattern, which is, of course, one of the main topics uh, today. And hopefully most of you or all of you already have heard about it or perhaps even have used it in your Task automation life. And uh, then uh, coming with the flow model pattern, um, which I invented uh, nine years ago. And I will give some details about it, how it's different pro, uh, from the page object. And I will uh, talk about how you can uh, incorporate it in end to end testing, where it's not just UI, what you're leveraging, but API, DB testing, log validations, and so on. So that said, let's get it started. So when we talk about design patterns, then for most people, uh, what they think about is the gang of four design patterns. Uh, those were the first ones uh, to be published in 1994. And actually it, uh, it has like 24 design patterns in this book uh, as creational, structural, behavior, uh, design patterns. And uh, as test automation is uh, not just a testing activity, but also a coding and development activity as well, it is very important for us test automation engineers uh, to know what the design patterns are, the gang of four design patterns are. Of course, we don't have to know and use all these 23 design patterns, but it's good to be aware of them and to know some of them. Typically, singleton uh, people who use uh, who do salem testing, they have been using that, uh, or they had been using that uh, more for uh, the drivers, to making sure there's only one driver. Uh, factory method and builder have been used a lot as well. And uh, my personal favorite is the facade pattern. It's uh, very useful in testing. And actually uh, the test automation design patterns that I'm going to show to you are building on the facet pattern. So what is uh, the facet pattern itself? So when you have um, a big, uh, larger uh, body of code that you don't necessarily want to, want to see the details of, you just want to uh, use it, you just want to use it as a service, then you can basically create a facet over it and call that service without knowing the, the implementation it does. Uh, and that's actually what's happening in the page objects as well. I will show you the details later on, but basically when you want to uh, click on a button, do you want to know how you can locate that button and like what, what's the look, uh, how the locator looks like? You don't necessarily need to know that, you just need to be able to call that uh, page object and be able to uh, invoke a click uh, action on it. And uh, that's a basic idea of the flow model as well and many other test automation design patterns as well. So this way you can maintain your code much better, be able to use them in many uh, places. So it's a pretty sweet uh, design pattern. So as I mentioned, this is actually leveraged in uh, many of the test automation specific design patterns. The 
most prominent one, the page object, which was uh, invented in the beginning of the 2000s by Simon Stewart. Uh, and uh, that's the first one that was leveraging fa uh, the facet pattern in test automation. And uh, so the next one is the screenplay pattern, which was uh, invented a couple of years later in 2007 or 2008, somewhere around that time by Anthony Marsano. And uh, this, uh, uh, how it's different is that they are focusing more on the users. So the page object focuses on the pages. That's in the name as well. So create page models, and uh, that's your main focus. In screenplay, you focus more on the users and what you can do with the users. The flow model that I invented uh, another couple of years later in 2013 uh, focuses on the user actions. So that's uh, the more prominent there, like what your users can do, not how your users, users look like and uh, what they are. It's more focused on just being able to do your actions and concatenated actions, which you can call as user journeys. The UI objects, uh, which was invented by my colleague, Roman Yivlev, uh, a year or two after the formula was invented, uh, that focuses more on how you operate your pages. So instead of, of defining uh, the page models, you are just defining how certain elements of a page can, uh, can typically be uh, interacted with. Like for example, with a button, you can click on it, you can check what the text on the button is and so on. So you define typical uh, actions that you can do with those objects. So this is uh, how these four most uh, known and used uh, test automation design patterns uh, look like. Of course, there are other design patterns for test automation as well, but I just uh, selected these four uh, for today. Okay, so uh, the page object, it's very important to know, I think the history of it, of course, like being able to use it, you don't necessarily have to know it, but I think it's always good to know where these are coming from and how they were they came to be. And so um, the people at Fort Works uh, were using the HTTP uh, unit for test automation purposes. And they were trying to figure out something, how, how they can make it better and uh, how they can have a more object-oriented, uh, focused uh, test automation. That's how the concept of the web driver and the page object were born in the early 2000s. And um, basically, uh, Martin Ford was the one who came up with the idea of the window driver pattern. And that was the basis what, uh, Simon Stewart used uh, later on. Okay, and the first time it was publicly uh, revealed was a couple of years later in 2007. And that was the first speech by Simon Stewart about the web driver and the page object. Okay, so that's how Selenium and page object and all these uh, came to be. Uh, so the history of flow model uh, is a couple of years later, uh, when I was working inside EPEM on, on a project, on a mobile test automation project, I was leveraging the page objects. But uh, it was an iOS project, and I felt that I don't necessarily need to build page objects, but I do need to be able to reuse the actions and the concatenated user actions, the user flows, that's when I was thinking how I could do that. That's when the flow model uh, was born. And later on, I uh, started thinking how I could kind of use these two uh, patterns together. I will give you some details later on. So the first time I publicly talk, talked about it was a year later in, uh, on the HASTIF conference in 2014. And the first standalone presentation of the flow model pattern was two years ago. and. Uh, the first bigger sharing of it was last year on the Starist. And uh, now you can find an article on it uh, on my site and also a public example. I'm still actually working on it to make like for me to be more satisfied with how the code looks like, but you can already see uh, the development in progress on uh, my GitHub page. Okay, so that's how the page object and the flow model were born. And um, 
let me go into details with uh, the page object pattern first. So when you look at this uh, piece of code, uh, then what is your first thought? What does this do exactly? So probably, uh, as I'm talking about uh, test automation, you probably figured out that this is a test script. Okay, but um, what does it do exactly? And you start seeing login there, then you see some username, password, and uh, then a, a home button as well, and some home screen. So probably this is a, a login a scenario and a successful one. And uh, if you were thinking about that, then you guessed it right. But probably it takes a little bit uh, more time to really know what is going on there, what are the different steps and like what exactly you are doing. So it's not necessarily the neat neatest way to write a test script and it's not necessarily the best way to do it in a, a real project where you want to have dozens or even hundreds or thousands of uh, test cases and you're not going to be able to maintain such a solution which consists of uh, linear scripts just like this one. And uh, whenever I see someone uh, seriously considering uh, building a test automation with this kind of test scripts, this is how my face looks like. Okay, so that's how uh, the page objects can help you uh, because Basically what uh, it does is it helps you model your pages that you're going to interact with. You're going to create a class file for each of the pages that you are going to test. And uh, you're going to um, store the locators and the web elements uh, of the elements that you are going to uh, interact with on the ones that you are going to uh, uh, interact with and validate. And uh, so you can have all sorts of elements like buttons, speakers, text boxes, and so on. And you can click on those, you can type a text, you can read the text that's there, you can maybe even uh, check uh, how they are located or where compared to other elements. You can write all sorts of different uh, test cases this way. So what it does is if you're interacting with an element, multiple times, you don't have to copy paste that piece of code from one test to another. You just uh, going to create uh, a facet and you're just going to call that surface. So whenever you have to make any changes, you only make it at one place instead of in 50 places, for example. So that definitely is going to reduce the maintenance cost for you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, about the solid principles after sip of water. So uh, the solid principles is just like with design patterns, it's very useful for developers and of course for test automation engineers. And actually uh, when I interview people or my colleagues interview people to senior or especially to lead level, they, we tend to ask questions about uh, uh, coding principles and design patterns as well. So along with uh, knowing the page objects, it's very important to know uh, the solid principles as well, because uh, these are actually really, really useful in test automation too. Uh, today, I'm only going to talk about the first one. And you will see why, why I decided to talk about that one. So the single responsibility, uh, what it uh, does is, if you look at the left side of, of the screen, you see a bunch of shapes uh, there. So um, when you implement a shape class and you decide to actually implement triangle, the circle and rectangle inside that very same class, what uh, it will, generate is going to be a really long class file and uh, with too many responsibilities. And in case you want to make any change uh, in the circle, then you might uh, introduce a change in the rectangle and or the triangle as well. So what it means that you are um, potentially introducing uh, bugs in other functionality. So maybe what is uh, 
an expected functionality for a circle might be a not expected functionality for all the other shapes. So in this uh, case, you are having two issues. First, potentially introducing bugs that you obviously don't want to. Uh, second, making your class file less readable because it's going to be long, uh, bigger and bigger. Of course, this example is a very simple one and um, it's going to be easy, still kind of easy to uh, read such a, a longer class file. But if you think about uh, the class files that you have seen in your life, I guess you have seen uh, class files, not just hundreds of lines of code, but even thousands or maybe 10,000s of uh, codes. Uh, you can, uh, I don't know how long the view class file for Android is right now, but a couple of years ago, it was uh, uh, shy of 20,000 uh, lines of code. So that was a really big one. Anyway, going on words uh, with a single responsibility. So what you can do is instead of keeping everything, all the logic in one class file, you can separate them in three different class files. You can still have like a shape uh, class that they can inherit from so that they have some commonality between them uh, because they should, but, uh, but they are still in three uh, separate uh, class files. So whenever I make any changes, in the triangle, I'm not going to affect the other two shapes here. And that's, uh, that's a very neat uh, way to handle uh, the class files. Okay, uh, so how, of course, in this case, in this example, it's very easy to determine the different responsibilities and how you can slice up uh, uh, a class file. But um, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, give, uh, give the answer. Of, of where you where you are making that cut, and uh, so Uncle Bob, who came up with the re uh, single responsibility in the nineties, he was asked many times, like, okay, how do you determine um, where to make your cut, how to slice up your class files or methods, and uh, he, he was thinking about it for a couple of years, and I think it was around two thousand seven. I think that's the year when he finally came up with a really good explanation. And what he said was uh, and that the changes uh, come from uh, a single person or a group of people. So you have to think about the reason for change. And now coming back to page objects, and that's why I, I decided to talk about the single responsibility, because I would like to show you uh, what responsibilities the page objects has. And uh, I'll give you uh, around roughly half a minute for you to think about who could be the people responsible for any changes in the locators, in the elements, in the actions, and the user flows. So I'll give you 30 minutes. Please think over who you think uh, are the ones responsible for these different responsibilities. And then I will show you my version. Okay, so let me show you my version. So I think the locators and elements, uh, if there's a necessity for a change that comes uh, from developers. For the actions and the user flows, now that's a little bit debatable. It could come from the business or from the uh, testers or from both. But uh, it really depends on your company culture and your project uh, setup. I think uh, in most cases, uh, the reason for change comes from testers and not from the business. Of course, if you are following BDD and a real BDD, not just uh, writing test automation using the Gherkin language, that's not real BDD. BDD is a whole process where you involve everyone starting from the business. So already from the analysis and design phases, you start including people. Now, if that happens, then the reason for change come from, comes from business. 
unfortunately, in most cases, that's not, not true. And I would say that it comes uh, from the testers or test automation engineers. Anyway, uh, however we see it, it's a minimum uh, two group of people uh, that change can originate from, which means that the page objects, uh, the page objects have way too many responsibilities, more than one. So it breaks the single responsibility. So that's why uh, actually how uh, some of the other um, design patterns were also uh, created. And uh, some people were uh, saying that uh, it's not just the single responsibility that uh, the page object uh, uh, breaks, but also the open closed uh, principle. I don't fully agree, or I would say it's not as big of, issue, of an issue as the single responsibility part. Some people say that it breaks the Yakni principle, which is you are never going to need it. Uh, but actually, that's not true because so what people are saying that in page models, you are going to create a class file for each of the pages, for each of the uh, web elements. Uh, you're, you're going to store the locators and web elements, and you're not going to interact with all of those uh, elements, which is probably true. But then if you are doing that, it's actually not uh, the page object who is breaking that uh, principle, but it's you. So it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's the people who are uh, who are breaking the Yagni and not the page object. So it's all up to the, uh, to the to your design and to make sure that you are only going to store elements that you're going to interact with. Okay, uh, and lastly, a little bit uh, related is that the page factory is not recommended anymore by its inventor, uh, Simon Stewart. You can see, I think for 2013, maybe 14, uh, it's on YouTube. You can find uh, a, a keynote session from him where he talks about uh, why he doesn't recommend the page factory anymore. Okay, so we went through uh, the potential issues with the page objects. Now it's time to talk about how you can fix that. And first I'm going to focus only on UI test automation because the page objects are for UI test automation. And the first time I was uh, leveraging the flow model was in uh, UI test automation. Okay, so on the left side, you see a house which represents the page object pattern. On the right side, you see a house which represents the flow model pattern. So on the left side, there's a facet uh, over the uh, building and all the pages, widgets, user actions, user flows are stored here. So if you would like to use any of these services, you are going to uh, refer to that one facet. Now in the flow model pattern, how it looks like you have your pages and your widgets here. So all your page models, if, essentially uh, as facets, but over those facets, there's another one, uh, the flow, uh, flow models. This is where you have your user actions and user flows, which are actually going to leverage uh, the page models. So that's how it looks like, but let me go on and show you some more examples to make it a little bit clearer. So first I want to talk about how the UML state machine diagram uh, looks like. Now uh, you can see an example here, login scenario. So you have a main, main page. Uh, that's your state. You are on the on the main page right now. And then you can transition from one page to another uh, with a transition and uh, any kind of actions here. So you click on the sign in button, you land on the login page. Then of course you type in your credentials, click on the login button and you land your, on your profile page. Once you click the log out button, you get uh, logged out and you're back on the main page. So that's a very uh, simplified uh, login scenario, but this is uh, how a state machine diagram looks like. So you have states and from states to another, uh, from one state to another, you get uh, with a transition. And this is actually how uh, a flow model could be designed as well, because, uh, Previously, if you recall, the page models store all the elements, all, the, uh, all their locators, all their actions, 
and all the concatenated user actions, the user flows. So everything is there. So this is what these are the last two. These last two. These are the ones that you are going to make a call to in your test scripts. And so why not separate them and instead have all the pages only have the locators and web elements and kind of show you what the current state is uh, of your application. So where you are standing. And uh, the flow models are basically showing you, and excuse me for clicking here. So the flow models are showing you how you can uh, transit from one state to another. So basically from one page to another, or even staying on the very same page. When you are typing in your credentials, that's, an, uh, that's a user action as well. You type in your, pass, uh, your username, your password, and you're still staying on the login page. Once you click that login button, and of course, in case your credentials are correct, then you're going to land on the profile page. That's how it looks like. Okay, uh, I hope that this is uh, clear this way. Uh, and I will show you some more examples, some coding examples uh, very soon to make it uh, even clearer. But first, let me show you uh, a trial architecture. The, and where the flow models and the page models reside. So typically you're going to have your test scripts here in the test scripts layer. You would have all the application independent libraries in the core layers, uh, core libraries. So basically the base test, uh, some project common libraries, additional libraries. So maybe a base page as well. And the base page would be inherited by uh, the base uh, page models. The base test would be inherited by your a base test and basically the flow models, maybe if you have a user actions uh, classified here, would be inherited uh, by the flow models and they are going to leverage whatever facets the page models uh, offer. And I will show you that very soon. So, yep, these two models or type of models reside somewhere in uh, between, so in the business logic where you have all the application dependent libraries. Okay, so going forward with that uh, trial layer example, let me show you uh, how this login flow looks like. Okay, so I already mentioned the base page. You're going to create your page models based on that base page. So this is an application independent class file, but this is, these are application dependent class files. So you are, of course, going to have not just pages, but widgets as well. And the login flow is going to be leveraging the facets of these uh, page models. And uh, there's this login test, which is only going to refer to the facets, going to uh, use the facets of the login flow. The login test should not make any call to the pages because these are these only have static uh, elements, no user actions. Okay. So let me uh, give you the first uh, example, first coding example. This is something that you have seen a couple of minutes ago uh, with that little puppy not being uh, satisfied. And uh, of course, we are not satisfied with this code. But first, it's okay. We want to start our test automation. So we start with a linear script just to prove that uh, we can do test automation uh, for our product. But then we want to make sure that it's maintainable and it's readable and, and it's looking shiny and neatly. So what did we do first? What I would uh, recommend is first start with the structure of the application, so the page models. So create your uh, page models. I'm only showing one of them here, the login page. This is actually an Android example. So that's why you are seeing this solo, get view, resource ID, and so on. So this is uh, what you're going to do. You're going to create your page objects, and then you're going to refactor your login test, now leveraging these page models. So when you are doing your refactoring, it's okay first to reference to the page objects. I remember, I know that I told you not to do that, <laughs> but uh, the very first time for the very first test script, it's absolutely fine. So you're going to have your page models here and uh, your login test is going to leverage the facets of uh, these page models. So that's your first uh, uh, refactoring cycles. 
And uh, now you already know where you are, what page uh, you are on, uh, and what elements you are interacting with. So that's already pretty nice and makes the code maintainable and uh, easier to understand. Still, uh, it's not perfect. That's why we go on to do the next uh, cycle of refactoring. And that's when we are creating the flow models. In this case, we only have to create one uh, log, uh, login flow and that's it. So in the login flow, you have all sorts of different uh, steps like opening the login screen, typing your username, password, and finishing the successful login. Okay. And of course, there are a bunch of other uh, steps that you would store here and maybe some concatenated uh, steps as well. So what's very important, all of your uh, actions, uh, application specific actions, it's very important to highlight, uh, all the application specific actions are going to be stored here. You are leveraging all of the page models here. So you can see that now I moved all the page uh, objects here, menu, sign in button, login page, username, and so on. So I don't have, I won't have those in the test script anymore. And now if I want to see where I am, now I have to go into the, uh, to the flow models. That's where I'm going to see it. But if I want to know what I'm doing, I'm going to know that already uh, on, in the test script. So I see that I'm going through a login flow. So I'm exactly know what type of testing I'm doing. And that's testing of the login scenario. And uh, so I also see what are the different test steps that I'm making here. I know exactly that I'm opening up the side menu. I'm opening the login screen, typing my username and password, finishing the login, uh, validating that I'm uh, logging in as Starf Vader, and opening the side menu button, uh, I mean the side menu, to be able to log out. And uh, I can read through this, just like with people, how, how people are saying that BDD provides you a way to read your tests in English. Uh, it's the same here, but it's even more simplified because instead of having like even Van Dance, now you have uh, an even more simplified English that you can uh, follow and you don't even have to uh, leverage Cucumber, spec for any other such tools. It's all built by yourself. And now all the login flow is hiding the pages from the uh, tests and leverages their facets and the tests are leveraging the facets of the login uh, of the login flow in this example. Okay, so this is how they compare to each other. As you can see, uh, as I was going through uh, the different steps of uh, refactoring, I may shrink. I was able to shrink. Uh, the size of the test script and ultimately have a much smaller test script once I got to leveraging flow models and a much more readable one. So this is how it looks like. And uh, let me stop here a little bit. First of all, for me to grab a little bit of water and for you to <laughs> see and, and digest uh, the differences between the three types of creating uh, test scripts. All right, but this uh, presentation is not over. So you, now hopefully you know how to create flow models for your UI test automation, but actually you can leverage uh, the flow model in other types of testing as well. So let's look at the different types of testing. So of course there are a millions millions way of describing the test levels, test types, and the test and uh, write uh, drawing, uh, the test pyramid. You can have like an upside down arrow class shape. You can have three, four, five levels, whatever levels you want. Um, I myself, I'm following this type of uh, testing pyramid for a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, I think and now we have a little bit more modern way of thinking. Back in the day when people were defining it with unit testing, 
uh, integration testing, system level testing, acceptance testing, then they were focusing more on the traditional way of uh, software development, which is waterfall and V model. But well, I know that there are still companies who are following those and there are companies who are trying to make a transformation to agile and also to um, leverage uh, DevOps practices as well. And if you want to do that, then one, from a quality point of view, you also have to transform your uh, old fashioned pyramid to a more modern way of thinking. So these levels, on the bottom one, you have the unit testing still yeah, that's untouched. Then you have the component, which is an integration testing, type of integration testing. Then the contract uh, testing, which again is a type of uh, integration testing. But now here you are focusing more on integrating to other systems and checking whether your contracts are correct or not. And um, so once you are going to end-to-end -end testing, that's the system level integration actually. And this is where uh, depending on how much efforts you have, you might only focus on your subsystem. Then that means that you are only focusing on uh, the final result, making sure that when you go through all your screens or uh, making all your API calls, they are working correctly. They, typically you should be already connected to other systems as well. And this is uh, what I'm going to be talking about right now. Once uh, you're using live services and live data, real data. Okay, so my example now is going to be an end-to-end -end API testing. Of course, you may have a situation where you're leveraging both UI and API uh, calls as well. But in this uh, example, I'm only focusing on API testing for, uh, because I have already showed you, shown you how you can uh, leverage flow model for UI testing. Let's see how you can leverage it for API testing. Okay, so here, instead of having page models, you're going to have utility classes. In this utility classes, you have uh, a way of making a call to your different services and uh, different in different ways. Get, post, boot, delete, whatever one you want to do. And this is what you're going to describe in these uh, utility classes. Okay. And of course, if you're making atomic calls, then you're not going to leverage the flow model. But if you're not making atomic calls, but you are actually uh, making calls that are dependent on each other and you are waiting for responses to be able to do your next uh, step, then you're actually having a, a user journey here that you are testing. And my example here is a suspension flow, uh, a suspension of a credit card. So let's say that you have an account, uh, you log in, you, you get uh, your card suspended, and then you try to make a transaction. Of course, that shouldn't work. Now you make, you unsuspend this card, you try to do the same transaction again, and now it should succeed. Basically, that's uh, what the example looks like. And um, so this is how the code will look, uh, look for you. So first, you have an account, you need to be able to log in with that active user and valid and uh, check whether that card uh, that you are going to use later in the test is a valid card. If it's a valid card, then you suspend that card. Now you validate whether the suspension actually went through or not, and then you make a valid transaction. But because your card is suspended, you have to validate uh, that this transaction didn't go through. So you validate it during the suspension. And of course, validate the actual response that it tells you that it's suspended then you go and unsuspend this card and check whether that unsuspension goes through. And uh, so whether you in the uh, DB records are still being shown as, uh, as suspended or not. And also in your uh, app logs, whether you are suspended or not. Okay, so hopefully it went through and you are unsuspended now. You try to make a valid uh, transaction and because you are not suspended anymore, your balance uh, should decrease. Okay, so that's how it looks like. And uh, now, first thing, you can see that uh, compared to the previous example, I 
in the previous example, I tried to be as simple as possible. So I used only one flow, a login flow. Here I'm leveraging more flows, account flow, suspension, and uh, transaction flow. So three different uh, flow models. And uh, when you look at it, you know exactly what's going for. So on a high level, you are you know what what steps you are making. But in each of these uh, uh, steps, there could be some additional steps or validations that you are taking. So as an example, for the validation of whether you suspended your card or not, you need to check the response and the response code, response body. You want to check it in the database as well. And probably even that is a, a bunch of validations. And I'm only showing just, I'm calling the validation of, uh, of the DB, but probably you are validating more records of there. And then you validate also in a in a log uh, log validator. I'm not a log validator, but uh, in a in a service where you can check uh, logs, for example, Splunk, whether your card got suspended or not. So this is uh, how it looks like. And then this is what uh, these are the services that the flow models are going to provide you. Of course, in this example, you didn't want to like write all the four steps one by one it's much easier for you to just call this one because you just want to check uh, whether it got suspended or not. If the flow itself changes, now you have to change the only in that flow model, the suspension flow. Okay, so to summarize it, uh, the flow model doesn't break the single responsibility, so it fixes that issue of the page model. So that was one of the main reasons I came up with it. Uh, because it fixes it by introducing another layer of facades, uh, now you, you have a higher abstraction and improved maintainability because now you, uh, you can reuse even the actions as well, much more easier in the user flows. And you have a better readability. Uh, you know what the tests are doing exactly. Of course, because of a better readability, it's going to be easier for you to ramp up juniors to your project or uh, new project newcomers. Uh, actually, this is something that I think it was 2014. At the end of 2014, there were three junior developers that I worked with, two Android and one iOS developer. And uh, so they were able to be uh, productive already on the second day. I uh, sat down with them for one day, I showed them how uh, the solution looks like, how I typically write test cases, how the, the flow models uh, look like. Next day, they were already uh, creating tests. This is how, how effective uh, the flow model is. Okay, and uh, another good thing is that you can leverage flow model not just in UI testing compared to all the other test automation specific uh, design patterns. You can leverage it in other types of testing, for example, API testing, DB validation, and so on. And, uh, but there's a draw, kind of drawback. You still need to have some practice, of course, with it because it's new yeah. and different from, from what people are generally using or most people. And uh, so it takes some time to get accustomed to it. And especially if you are not coming with a uh, tester background, uh, then it might uh, be a little bit more difficult to come up with uh, the flow models, defining them. But in that case, uh, if you have any testers in your uh, organization, especially inside your team, that tester should be able to help you with uh, defining the flow models. If uh, he or she already created pretty neat uh, test case uh, or test suits, then you will be able to leverage that for creating the flow models. And that said, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And uh, in case uh, you want to read and hear more about the, the flow model or other, other patterns as well, like for example, the trier testing architecture, uh, you will be able to read some articles on my website. So far, I only have the flow model pattern, but eventually I will release some more articles as well. And uh, if you want to contact me or just simply follow me for what's yeah, knew about myself, then you will be able to see that on Twitter and LinkedIn, and you can see all my uh, videos uploaded uh, to YouTube, and I have a, a list where, where you can find them very easily. So 
again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me just show references here. So you will be able to uh, use these links later on. And I'm all ears. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Hey, Peter, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh... I have actually two questions. Uh, both of uh, one of them is to more like REST API testing, and one of them to the first part of UI testing. Mm -hmm. I'll maybe start with the the last one. So in general, I like the approach. Um, I see it's kind of practical approach on the projects uh, should work well. But I have more like more high level abstraction <laughs> question, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. If we return maybe to page thirty six, where we had, um, yeah, 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 six, yeah, 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 like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, we are talking about uh, uh, breaking or not breaking single responsibility principle, but still, for example, for transaction and for suspension, I see at least two responsibilities. Mm -hmm. One sure, of yeah. them is interacting with. Uh, applications through uh, um, REST API, which is sending requests, right, and obtaining mm -hmm. responses. And second one, uh, validation, the results, so like real real assertion or testing, okay, validation. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it, at least in my practice, I try to separate these trans responsibilities because for me, like interac in, in, interaction with the system and validation of the results, is two different uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts in that regard? <laughs> okay, so for uh, my first thought. Uh, so this is like, so what I'm showing here is how my mindset works and how I separate it. And uh, so that's not the golden answer to all the, like how everything should be separated. So if you are doing it that way, I think, I absolutely understand that mindset. And I think that's uh, that's good. Uh, for me, uh, of course, it would depend. Like if I have too many, too many actions, too many methods in that one class file, eventually I would uh, definitely separate it as well because I don't want it to bulk up to a really long class file. If it's a small one, I don't necessarily want to separate it because uh, from my point of view, the reason for change comes from one person, and that's the tester. In this case, myself. Uh, uh, well, in this case, the, the reason for change also can be from developer when they refactor the API. So that's exactly mm -hmm. why I asking the question. Yep. Only because you you raise that that, that mm -hmm. responsibility part and like who can be mm -hmm. uh, the initiator of change. And in this case, initiator can be developer who refactors mm -hmm. the API or a business owner or tester who changed the expected uh, result. So this is this is yeah. This is I asked the, for that question only because uh, that the talk was in that direction. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, you're absolutely right. So actually, then that's that's what I like because uh, again, uh, what I think and how I think and how I organize uh, my flow models in this case might. Uh, might not necessarily be the best in all the scenarios. So actually what you're bringing up, it's a good debate. And uh, maybe if we were working on the same project, uh, eventually uh, you might convince me and we would uh, separate it. So I think this is very important that uh, even if I have one way of thinking, I should uh, be always uh, open for change, just like in the open close principle. So, uh, I think that's a very good uh, feedback and very good review item. Yeah, thanks for the answer. And second answer uh, is relating to UI part. And maybe let's take a look at page 2930. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe the next one, next one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so um, again, uh, here maybe the, the question is i got the point the idea behind uh, flow pattern as i understand is is to take the responsibility of interaction from page objects and mm -hmm. move it into flow classes but leave the responsibility of uh, locating elements to the page objects something yes. like that mm -hmm. yeah uh, but still for me like when i read the test scripts for me it's a little bit 
uh, UI coupled, I would say. Because what I expected when you started uh, mm -hmm. talking about flow, I would expect that uh, when we write tests in flow uh, approach, like flow pattern approach, I would like to see tests in business or domain specific language, or right? Like, um, like a kin? Not, 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 not necessarily. Like if we mm -hmm. uh, test in Facebook, it would read like Facebook dot login as, and you pass a user model, and that's it for login mm -hmm. uh, scenario and that means that this flow would apply to anything if it's ui if it's mobile if it's api i whatever. see what you mean mm -hmm. yeah but here what i see i noticed here like uh, mm -hmm. that when i read flow model i still read in terms of ui open login screen why right, right? Mm -hmm. type username type password uh, like for me it's it's still ui language not domain specific language uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. And uh, actually, again, that's, uh, so I think the answer is going to be the same or very similar to to the previous uh, question. So again, it's uh, all up to how you feel. And for me, in this example, my focus was on this uh, login flow, uh, just that one, I'm not focusing on, okay, am I going to leverage it in uh, iOS as well? Or, or mobile web or desktop web. Am I going to leverage this in other applications or not? I shouldn't, by the way, but only one application, but that's another, another story. Okay, so uh, in that case, actually what you are saying, uh, that's another, another refactoring because when I'm focusing on only one application and my scope is one application, I don't think I necessarily have to uh, focus on on removing that uh, that UI part which you mentioned. Uh, if it is easier for the test automation engineer to build the test cases that way, I think uh, it's better to leave it that way. But on the other hand, what you mentioned, uh, the more business focused uh, or more business oriented way of creating the test cases uh, should be enforced when it's at least two different platforms that you are supporting because you might have a little bit different uh, way of describing the UI uh, on the different uh, platforms, but the business logic is still going to be the same. You, you want to log in, you want to open a specific uh, uh, page to be able to do that, but the business logic stays the same. So I think uh, what you are mentioning, that would be a third recycling, uh, I mean, not recycling, refactoring cycle. Yeah, and the point with multiple multiple platform is not necessary because sometimes uh, UI flow may change even though from business perspective, it's still the same, like, but but okay, I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I got the answer, thanks. Thank you very much. And I see something in the chat. Yeah, probably. Someone got his answer. Okay. Are there any other questions? I guess uh, that's a no, but we can wait a little bit. Maybe some more questions are going to. I can, I can always ask questions by, by people open, yeah. still thinking. So yeah. you mentioned screenplay pattern, and I also like screenplay pattern. And what I found uh, here, I have a lot, I, I notice a lot of similarities because usually um, people call such what, what, what is called now flow, like flow pattern. It's usually like in simpler world, world it's like steps, right? I, 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 um, I saw many projects where people liked moving some uh, more maybe complex scenarios into something they called like steps. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, in, in, in such a framework as Serenity BDD, they also have this support like built in, if you're familiar with that. One so mm -hmm. uh, yeah this this approach uh, kind kind of cool cool one yeah I, I agree but thanks yeah the question was in yeah, comparison just, uh, between before uh, the question may, screen, may screenplay yeah between screenplay pattern and uh, your pattern what's the what's the principal difference uh, 
Okay, uh, so uh, before that, uh, so one thing uh, I would like to add. So uh, if you recall, I mentioned that, so I came up with this in 2013. And actually I was recently making like a couple of years ago as well, I made some research and recently as well, actually I found a uh, one uh, video that was, I think uploaded last year or something, which was actually originating from 2014, the same year when I first uh, public talk, talked about uh, flow model as part of another presentation. So, uh, peep, so I'm not the first, I guess I'm not the first person who came up with a similar idea that uh, the actions should be, could be, and should be uh, separated from the structure of the application. So basically from the page models. And uh, since then, uh, luckily I have heard a couple of more people who are uh, building their uh, test automation solution this way, that uh, they are leveraging flow model. Maybe they call it in a different way, like business operations uh, or, or business logic or uh, workflows or however they call it. But the good thing is that other people also started thinking about it uh, this way as well, maybe implementing it in uh, a little bit different way. So everybody has a different mindset, of course. So I think the, the essential difference uh, to answering your question. So the essential difference between uh, the flow model and, um, and the screenplay is that the flow model is only focusing on uh, the steps and uh, user journeys. Uh, whereas the certainty also focuses uh, on the users. So you also define users and what you can do with those users. So I think that's a, a little bit uh, more complex and actually uh, I think many, many times that's necessary, not for everyone probably, but many times that's something that uh, you will need to do to, to be able to organize uh, your users. So I think that's in a nutshell what the basic differences are. And I see we have three more minutes and I see two more chat oh, yeah okay uh, so was that uh um, answer enough for you roman or yeah do you yeah, want good, to hear good. some more yeah definitely yeah thanks one okay all right so any other questions maybe or anything else to add I see some some comments. Thank you everyone for uh, for the nice uh, comments. Really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And again, uh, really appreciate uh, everyone uh, joining this session. And let me go back again to the uh, last slide. So. Pretty easy. If you, you can find my site, peterfeltazi.com, and you will be able to find all the information. And hopefully, I will be able to uh, soon reveal some more articles that are in progress. So, again, thanks for joining. Thanks for the opportunity for uh, the QA group. And uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.